Dusty Vision TV. Today I'll be reading another chapter from the book Who's Left by Curtis Howard. Curtis Howard is an original crip from San Diego, California. He has an amazing story and I encourage everyone out there to check out his book. Without further ado, here is a chapter from Who's Left by Curtis Howard, a story involving gangs, drugs, and prison life. Chapter 10, YA. In late November 1979, I ended up in juvenile hall once again. It was for a burglary charge that I walked upon after the burglary had already been committed. I agreed to watch over the stolen goods while my friend went to get his sister's car to load the property in. While he was gone, the police arrived to investigate and there I was sitting alone with the goods. I had nothing to do with the actual burglary, but of course I kept my mouth shut about the circumstances when they questioned me. Legally, I uh, was guilty of receiving stolen property because I knew the property was stolen, but back then I was in denial about it. I felt like I had been wronged, and when I received nine months for it, I took that attitude to Camp West Fork for youth with me. I had serious adjustment problems there, and I was fighting within an hour of my arrival. Two months later, another fight landed me back in court with an assault charge. I was found guilty of that charge and given a two-year term in the state of California Youth Authority. Paso Robles School for Boys was located in a small city of the same name. I arrived there with my homeboy Trey Dog on the same bus from the Norwalk Reception Center where we had been paired together for the past three months. The two of us were side by side for the entire YA experience. We even went to the same housing unit together after leaving the orientation building. Paso was nothing but gang members mainly black and Mexican, with a couple of white boys claiming to be members of white power gangs. My first fight occurred just a few days after my arrival. It was with the white boy that everyone warned me to stay away from. They said that he was crazy and not to pay him any mind. I assured them that if he disrespected me, I would pay him some mind, and I did. He approached me one day with a devious smile, but before he could open his mouth, I opened it for him with my fist. We both went to solitary confinement for two days. There were many whites in juvenile hall and in the country ran honor camps, but in the state institutions, you can count them on one hand. I saw many black and Mexican guys in YA who were in the juvenile system with me, but I never ran into a single white guy in YA that I had ever been in juvenile hall or county honor camp with. I questioned their whereabouts. Had all the whites got a sudden change of heart and stopped getting into trouble like the blacks and the Mexicans who are still here? This was my first time noticing racial disparities in the way the legal system dealt with minorities. YA was all about gangbanging. There were black and Mexican teens from throughout California with Los Angeles being the most dominant numbers wise. Everyone sized you up on arrival and asked, where are you from? Once you told them your city and gang, they would immediately run off to spread the news. They would then search for someone who knows you from the street so they could question them about where you stand. Bad information was sought out most because it was used as a tool to keep you in check or to make others feel better than you. Such information had to come from someone who knew you from the streets, and that's where the divide and conquer politics came into play. A group of dudes who would befriend one or two guys from the same street gang and use one as a witness against the other. They would show one favor in order to obtain damaging testimony against the other. The chosen one often played along to maintain favor and immunity from peer pressure. Peer pressure was the driving force in YA politics. And at some point, everyone submitted to it. I remember when a group of Los Angeles gang members applied this tactic to inquire about my status as a crip with my homeboy Trey Dog. They called me over to the table on the exercise yard where Trey Dog had been sitting with them. 
they attempted to cross-examine me. It was Big Papa from the Long Beach Insane Crips and two buff bloods from the Fruit Town Brims named Baby Loke and KC. I looked straight into Trey Dog's eyes on my way over to them. It was my way of letting him know that I did not approve of being discussed with outsiders. I could sense there had been some talk and I hoped that he had not allowed them to come between us. Him and I had bonded after being side by side for the past six months. We knew things about each other that we had never discussed on the streets as homeboys of the same gang. I found that Trey Dog had not said anything bad about me, character-wise, so they focused on my time of involvement. They said that I was not an OG if I had not been active by the year 1975. Apparently, Trey Dog had informed them that I had only been active for a few years. He was correct in saying I had been active for a few years at that time. We were currently in the year of 1980, and I had joined the streets in 1977. He had even given me credit for the year that I left the hood after being transferred from Gompers to the continuation school, so I wasn't disappointed with him. I just did not like the feel of being discussed in absentee. It had a very unsettling and deceptive vibe to it. I explained to the group that because the Crips and Bloods had started in San Diego a year or two later than Los Angeles, the cutoff time for OG status would be different. My reply started an interesting debate amongst all because what I said made sense and they had to reconsider. Trey Dog was very pleased at how well I handled myself. I diverted their questioning into a debate and everyone found interesting and became involved in. This took the focus off of me. There were only two ways to avoid peer pressure in YA. You had to outfight them or outsmart them. If you posed a physical threat, you were given some leniency, but not completely. At some point, fighting was necessary. Sadly, it was the only course of action that everyone acknowledged. Being intelligent was cool and respected, but you had to be intelligent enough to know when to kick some ass because sometime kicking ass is the intelligent thing to do. YA operated on group mentality and anything associated to toughness and manhood. If the term toxic masculinity was used back then as much as it is now, YA would be a perfect reference. I recall how, how everyone drank black coffee and smoked camel filtered cigarettes called humps because both were harsh and anything harsh was considered hardcore. A cigarette with a filter or a cup of coffee with cream and sugar make you look weak. Coffee was called mud due to the thickness of how people made it. Guys would commonly add three heaping tablespoons of instant coffee per one cup measurement of hot water to establish the harshest taste and effects of caffeine. I recall asking a guy for some coffee and he refused me because I told him that I would be adding cream and sugar. He accused me of trying to waste his coffee. Guys developed make-believe caffeine habits that they compared to that of heroin addicts. Whenever they ran out of coffee, they would frantically run to each other to get what they called a fix. Their behavior was that of people who now claim they must have their Starbucks to make it through the day. It was trendy and highly overrated. Music. Oldies were extremely popular in YA, and if you didn't listen to oldies music, you were not cool. These oldies were R&B love ballads from the late 60s and early 70s. Mary Wells, The Intruders, Marvin Gaye, The Stylistics, The Delphonics, The Dells, Barbara Mason, Martha Reeves, and The Vandellas, and many more. Oldies music is one thing that I was turned on to in YA that I truly did enjoy. On the streets, I'd been listening to mostly R&B groups that produced party music, but in YA, I had slowed it down. Reading. The book series of urban writers Iceberg Slim and Donald Goins were immensely popular with the black youth. These were stories of ghetto folklore and the fast life. It was a rite of passage to have read all the series and all of us traded and exchanged books until we had. Donald Goins had more books than Iceberg Slim, but if you didn't read them all, you were not cool. Many guys used quotes from these books and oldie songs 
in the letters to their girlfriends. Black literature. After I went through all the Donald Goins and Iceberg Slim novels, I had become so engrossed in black literature that I didn't want to stop. I gave up my gym activities one day for the optional library visit. Choosing library over anything else was unheard of in YA. I asked for black literature and was led to a section of so many authors that I had a hard time figuring out which one to check out first. I could only check out one at a time, so I started with the autobiography of Malcolm X. After I finished, I couldn't wait to find another one by him. When I ran out of Malcolm X to read, I was concerned that I may not find another black book as interesting. But I did. I ran across an author named Ralph Ellison and a book called The Invisible Man, then Shadow and Act. I found another black author named Richard Wright and read his book called Native Son. I couldn't wait to read another one by him. I rushed back to the library and found Black Boy, which was just as good as the first. After this, I started reading books about black revolutionaries and the civil rights movement. It helped funnel my gang mentality into something more proposal. I wondered why I had never seen or heard of these writers or saw their books before now. I felt that these books contained information that can influence my mindset, but they were being hidden from me. Although they were on the library shelf, it was something that I had to stumble across to find. In my later years of incarceration, most black literature was removed from the prisons and considered to be contraband. Black prisoners established underground book sharing networks where original covers had to be removed and replaced with non-threatening bindery. I read Soledad Brother by George Jackson when I was 17 years old in YA. But years later in prison, that same book would have been confiscated or led to me being placed in solitary confinement. Black Rep. After I began reading, it limited my participation in gang politics. A staff in my housing unit soon approached me about a position being open for black representative. He recommended that I run for the position, and then he strongly advised the others not run against me. Each race had a person elected to represent them. These assigned reps would address issues and file grievances with the administration on behalf of the prisoners. Reps would also act as attorneys to prisoners who had received behavior reports to keep them from possibly receiving additional time to their sentences. Reps from all races would come together regularly to address problems in general and to brainstorm possible solutions and or to present new proposals to the administration. They would then advise prisoners of the results following those meetings. The voting process for this position was corrupted. Gang members intimidated others to vote for their homeboys in order to reap the benefits of free movement to different areas of the facility. These freedoms allowed them to visit their homeboys in other housing units and deliver goods and contraband, whereas the average inmate could not go to other housing units. The gang elected rep would normally be a tough guy who could not read or write worth a damn, so one normally received misrepresentation on serious issues just so that he could visit and pass it off to his homeboys. The staff in my building was aware of these politics surrounding the voting process, and that is why he advised the others not to run against me. Ultimately, the position was given to me hands down, which was yet another corrupted but fair process. Corrupted because staff became involved in a prisoner-only process, but fair because it was already corrupted now, they would receive proper representation. I began to gain much respect from the youth prisoners for many successful arguments that I had won to make changes. I also won individual cases defending guys with behavioral reports. My first successful case was from my homeboy, Trey Dog. He was facing time for a fist fight with the dude from the Swans Blood Gang of Los Angeles. Trey Dog was really surprised when I spoke up to defend him at his hearing because I was using words that he didn't know I had in my vocabulary. Trey Dog had a great deal of respect for education and intelligence. He was impressed with my academic skills, just as a gang member would be towards one's fighting skills. This was rare, rare amongst gang members because most of them don't see past fighting or other forms of physical threat. Trey Dog was the first homeboy to show me respect 
for ap academics. My position is black inmate representative gained me much fame. Youth in different housing units began to request my services. This was unusual because every housing unit had their own assigned reps, but youth prisoners had the rights to representation of choice and most called upon me for it. To this day, I dispute black people who claim to have been rejected by other black folks for being educated. They claim that they were accused of trying to sound white for speaking correctly. I later realized that sounding white is not the issue people have with them. It was because of them not trying to sound black, that is the issue. People of all races have their own native tongues that they identify with phonetically. Malcolm X spoke eloquently, yet still sounded like a black man. Therefore, I never manipulated my native tongue and voice inflection to escape this fact when representing my peers. It's ridiculous to charge that blacks dislike their own for being educated when in fact we are the most proud of our friends and family who graduate or excel academically. We support and even brag about their accomplishments. As long as they don't start acting and sounding like white people. Gladiator School. Paso Robles School for Boys was very memorable to me as a youth but not in a positive way. It was a school for boys, yet I cannot recall any of the school parts. I know that we lined up for classes every morning to walk to the educational department, but I do not remember a single class or teacher there. I only remember the gang activity and politics. Prisoners referred to these youth authorities as gladiator school. Not only because there was lots of fighting, but because many times it was organized by staff. YA was the first place I experienced gladiator school fighting matches set up by authorities. Staff organized these fights by encouraging anyone they saw arguing to go out back and fight. They arranged these fights over domino and card game arguments or for something as small as someone cutting the line. One of the most memorable gladiator matches was between a Compton Crip named Pep and a white boy named Pearson. Pearson was one of only three whites in our unit. One day, he revealed that he represented white power and Pep overheard him. When they were having words, a white staff intervened and led them outside to the recreation yard to fight. Staff were eager to see this one because they secretly felt that Pearson had a good chance. We all watched together. They let the fight go on as long as possible to give Pearson the opportunity to turn the tables. But he never did. Pep came out on top. But Pearson put up a fight that was at least worth watching. Staff bet this fight among one another and could be seen paying each other off shortly after. These practices were first popularized in California prisons during the revolutionary prisoners era of the late 1960s up until the mid 1970s. Black prisoners were often set up to protect themselves from rival prisoners then shot and killed by guards in the process of defending themselves. Most notably, George Jackson and the Soledad brothers, a group of black revolutionaries who formed a vanguard to defend themselves. Yet these organized attacks were not for betting and entertainment purposes. They were racist acts by prison guards upholding white supremacy. In YA, we never referred to staff as cops or guards because they did not wear uniforms or carry weapons and pepper spray. They, were, they wore civilian clothing and were equipped with alarm buttons that they used for backup whenever fights broke out that they didn't stage themselves. They also allowed us to wear our own clothing. So the gang culture was still very present in the way we dressed, which contributed to our behavior. We wore our blue and red bandanas, Godfather hats, Stacy Adams shoes, and whatever else we could get our family and friends to send. Aside from making us attend school, for those few hours, they offered no other programs or forms of re-entry planning, which were very necessary for us youth that, at that stage in our lives. It was our most critical period of incarceration because juvenile records are sealed at 18, so everyone there had a fresh start by coming into adulthood without criminal records. YA is the last stop for youth before prison. These missing elements of rehabilitation led me to conclude that YA was in fact a school for gang banging and profiting from story, storing bodies rather than change. It enlightened me on how weak and unconcerned the system was toward rehabilitation. 
I was expecting something entirely different. Within just a couple years, 90% 90, 90 of the guys that I was in and YA with would end up dead or in state prison, including myself. In Paso Robles, I was incarcerated with gang members from throughout California. The following are some of whom I speak on. Rick Rock, Morris from WVG and Watts, Papa Brider from the Insane Crips in Long Beach, Chicken from 11 Deuce Hoover Crips in LA, Baby Boy from Fruit Town Brims in LA, Ace from Looters Park Piru in Compton, Tretch from Five Deuce Broadway Gangster Crips in LA, Football from Br Bakersfield, Breakdown from Inglewood Family Bloods of Inglewood, Big Norman from Denver Lane Bloods in LA, Country Boy from Linwood Crips, Spanky Thomas from 107 Hoover Crips, Pep from Santana Block Compton Crips, KC from Fruit Town Brims of LA, Frog from Nickerson Gardens Bounty Hunter Bloods in LA, Angie from 3-2 Mob of Oakland, Tally from Hunters Point in San Francisco, and more. San Diego gang members included Trey Dog, Boss Hog, Stony D, Black Ice, Cold Kev, Lil Bulldog, all from the neighborhood Crips. Rap Dirty and T-Roll Townsend from the West Coast Crips. Other San Diegans were Fella Littleton from Dodge City, Nunu from Skyline Piru, John Boy from 5'9 Brims, Rulon from 5'9 Brims, and Mad Blood from Lincoln Park. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job is some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job is some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace.